Welcome to the first interview in the series with Dr. Eli Sheff and the Sexual Health Alliance. Today, for the first of our series, we are talking to Dr. Daniel Cardoso, who is the Mir <laughs> I can't say it. Uh, could you say it for me, Daniel? Of course, of course, it's the Marie Curie um, Research Fellowship at the Manchester Metropolitan University. Thanks so much for joining us today, Daniel. Could you explain a little bit about your fellowship? Uh, thank you for, for having me and it's wonderful to finally talk to you after all these years citing you and reading your excellent work. Um, so basically the Marie Curie Fellowship um, is, is an individual fellowship given by the European Research Council and it's what's called is a career advancement fellowship. So the idea is to boost your academic profile through research. So if you're uh, a top researcher, you won't get a Marie Curie Fellowship because this is not meant or top research is meant for people who are, you know, starting off or who had had to leave academia and trying to get back. And so as a way to boost their research profile. Wonderful. How interesting. Congratulations on receiving. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure there's a lot of competition. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that there's a lot of competition. Uh, I only got it at the second attempt, so to speak. Uh, the first attempt I got, so out of 100%, I got rated 93.5 and I still didn't get it. Mm. So it's very, I think it's... Um, very competitive. Yeah, it's about 13, if I'm not mistaken, it's about 13% of the applications get funding. Well, congratulations. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. So changing tracks just slightly, yeah. um, how did you start researching polyamory? So about 10 years ago, give or take, um, I had to decide on what to do and what to research for my master's thesis. And I started looking around back in Portugal and no one had ever, you know, had ever written anything on polyamory at the more academic level, at least that I was aware of. And so I thought, you know, why not join um, activism and, and research and try to do this thing, which is to try and get some academic legitimacy uh, into the topic in my own home country. And so basically that was the idea. I was already doing activism and I thought to combine activism and academia. Wonderful. Fantastic. And what are you looking at currently? You... So currently, currently in this research project, I'm doing a transnational comparative study on consensual non-monogamy activism by comparing Portugal and the UK. So I'm trying to understand how these activist movements came about, how they organize, um, and how the ideas, the concepts, the strategies uh, move geographically or not from one place to another, how they differ, how they are connected and so on. And does that also involve media analysis? Are you analyzing how the media portray polyamory? Yeah, so Actually, my background, even though right now I'm in the Department of Sociology, my background is in communication sciences. And so uh, what I'm doing right now is comparing the media representations of uh, polyamory, swinging, et cetera, et cetera, in these two countries to try and understand how these social movements impact or not and how they impact or not the, the media agendas or the media topics and how these things get represented into a, a wider audience. So what I've been doing is I've been um, collecting the last 10 years worth of journalistic coverage on consensual non-monogamies on written uh, newspapers and uh, news magazines and so on, on consensual non-monogamies both in Portugal and the UK, and I'm doing content analysis uh, and trying to uh, compare, you know, 
who are the social actors that get mentioned, who, what is the perspective under which consensual non-monogamy is introduced, what are the rhetorics associated with it, and so on, both to try and understand how these things get represented, but also to try and identify who might be the key players in these social movements and how mm -hmm. they get you know, portrayed to the public through the media. And do you have any kind of initial findings to tell us? So you're still in the early stages. Well, I've completed um, the the analysis for Portugal, but not the UK yet. And I'm going to very shortly explain why. Um, I I've gathered about 260 uh, news pieces in Portugal, and for the same time frame, I've gathered about 1,800 for the UK. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it takes time. It takes time to yes, go through all of that. Yes, that's a large project. Yeah, yeah. And this Population is only the beginning. The difference between like those two countries in terms of their, like how big are they? How big does Portugal compare to the UK? I mean, the UK is a lot bigger than Portugal, both okay. in terms of geographical area and in terms of the number of, of inhabitants. Population. Yeah, right. in terms of population. Okay. Um, but I think it's also relevant to note that the word itself, for instance, polyamory, it was originally an Anglophone word. It was right. an Anglophone concept. It was circulated through the Anglo sphere, so to speak. And so there's a level of affinity um, that you have with one language and one culture that you don't directly have with the other one. Uh, that's one explanation. Another explanation, this is just anecdotal evidence, but apparently uh, the British press has some sort of uh, fixation with swinging. Huh. So there is, a, there is an, an inordinate amount of short and, and very um denigrating and unfortunate news pieces about swinging in the uk mm -hmm. and you can't say the same thing about portugal so it's not it doesn't have the same amount of visibility or presence or media moral panics around swinging so that explains some of the difference um another factor that actually helps to explain the differences is the fact that one of the keywords that was used uh, which is open relationship or open relationships is um, an expression in English that is used in a whole lot of contexts uh -huh. that have nothing to do with you know actual uh, intimate relationships and so um, some of the material that I'm getting in English I, I'm actually just sort of ignoring it because it has ex uh, nothing to do with uh, consensual non-monogamies you know uh, I want to have a, a more open relationship with my child doesn't right. interest me. Yes, right. You know, uh, Meaning these... more communication, more honesty, more emotional connection. Exactly, exactly. Or, or, yes. um, or these these two countries need to develop more a more open relationship. Yes. You know, it's, it has nothing to do with consensual non-monogamy, so it gets picked up in the results, but then it gets discarded when it comes to analysis. Yes, um, makes a lot of sense. But from, from what I can tell you, um, from the Portuguese results, so one of the most striking things for me is that less than half of the news pieces actually feature someone in a consensually non-monogamous relationship. Mm. So, <laughs> you know, people talk about consensual non-monogamies rather than having people you know, who are consensually non-monogamous speaking. Mm -hmm. So this, this issue of the voice of who has voice and who doesn't have voice in the media is super important. And from, from those, um, a very minute percentage um, actually features activists. So there's actually more um, fictional characters showing up in news pieces than there are activists. And most of the coverage is actually driven by celebrities. So whenever there's a celebrity that is known for, or that people claim has an open relationship, an open marriage, and so on and so forth, they get some amount of coverage, uh, much more so than actual uh, activists, you know, doing outreach work or trying to uh, educate people about relationship diversity 
and, and so on. And it's interesting to see, at least in the Portuguese uh, data, how the length of the, of the news piece is actually correlated with uh, a more positive or a more negative portrayal of consensual non-monogamies. So in-depth pieces tend to be more neutral or positive, uh, oh. Shorter news pieces tend to be more negative or more satirical. Oh, that's and very interesting. Opinion pieces are very much negative or satirical. Fascinating results. I look forward to hearing more about that as your yeah. research continues. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, finishing writing up a short report that is meant to be, you know, publicly accessible and publicly understandable, so non-academic-ish <laughs> in how it's written, presented. And what I'm going to do is I tr I'm going to try and put it out and gather some feedback about it and also try to gather some discussion on it mm -hmm. to see how people feel about that. Great. Well, if you send us the link, we can associate it with this video and people can give you some responses. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Listeners, please let Dr. Cardoso know what you <laughs> of their research. Thank you. Um, I was also interested in, maybe you could tell me about what characterizes European polyamorous communities um, kind of the status of non-monogamy in Europe and if it has any differences or similarities with the United States? So, um, well, I would say you're much better positioned than I am to talk about the United States and the USA communities. Um, most or at least some of what I know about the United States communities comes from reading your work, so <laughs> you have the okay. knowledge first firsthand. Um, Thank you. But what I would say is that there's a lot more different cultural influences in consensual non-monogamy activism in Europe than you find in the United States. Mm. And what I mean is that works of um, really interesting and engaging feminist authors from different cultures, from different backgrounds, from different languages, get spread, spread around throughout Europe um, much more easily than what I usually see happening in the United States. So I would say that the United <laughs> States is a bit more insular when it comes to its own activist and academic and just the day-to-day -day culture of polyamory. And then you have stuff like relationship anarchy, which was, you know, European in context. You have mm -hmm. queer reappropriations of consensual non-monogamies and a very big overlap between uh, queer activism and consensual non-monogamies. Um, anarchist um, activism, queer anarchism, and consensual non-monogamies, and so on. And so you see a lot of these things coming together. I know that in Portugal, for example, the experiences of people coming in from Germany, from Spain, and also from the UK were fundamental in sort of creating the matrix, the framework for consensual non-monogamy activism in Portugal. Uh, so all of these different cultures, all these different ideas, all of these different um, ethos, you know, that these practices of doing consensual non-monogamies, of thinking about uh, feminism, the intersection with uh, queer theory and, and queer activism, you find this, I think, much more vividly expressed in how people usually do uh, consensual non-monogamy activism in, in the in Europe, or at least in some parts of Europe, obviously, because I don't want to, you know, overgeneralize right. uh, in, in certain parts of Europe compared to the United States. And I think that up to a point, there is a certain, how should I put it? Um, let's put it like this. There is a cultural and linguistic hegemony coming out of the United States and coming out of what I usually call the Anglosphere. Yes. that people in Europe have to fight against and have to push back against. 
and that also generates its own interesting dynamics, I would say. Without doubt, yes. I could absolutely see how Europe would be much more just integrated and permeable in terms of blending thoughts, much more culturally as well. Whereas in the US, we're very ethnocentric, we're very isolationist and independent. It's all about just the individual. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, Europe is still part of the global north, and it's still part of white supremacy and white hegemony. I'm, I'm not even trying to argue otherwise. But at the same time, the fact that there are so many different languages, so many different cultures um, intertwining in such a small geographical space compared to, you know, to the United States, right. um, creates this really interesting dynamics. Uh, it's it's very rare for people in Europe to only speak one language, whereas that is much more common in certain areas of the United States and at the least entire the United States. Most people who are born in the United yeah. States only speak English. It's mostly our immigrant populations. Yeah, that speak. Yeah. Is there anywhere in Europe that it's not safe to be po openly polyamorous? I think there's, um, I mean, I don't want to single out countries, but if you look up international news about what's been happening in some parts of Hungary, uh, what's been happening in Poland and so on. So there's, there are a few countries in Europe that are sort of devolving into this um, right-wing ultra-nationalist re neo-Nazi revivalism, which is also happening in the United States, but in a different yes. way. Right. Um, and and I, th I would say that those places are places where it's actively dangerous to be polyamorous, mm -hmm. just like it's even more dangerous to be an LGBTQI person. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. obviously I'm not saying that these two things are uh, the same or that present the same level of danger, mm -hmm. obviously, um, but where there is no space for gender and sexual diversity in general, there is very little space for polyamory and consensual monogamy. Right, yes. Well, this has been incredibly interesting, and I have one last question for you, and I realize that you are not a counselor or a therapist, so maybe this is just from your vast knowledge and <laughs> your life in general. Mm. If you had one piece of advice for counselors and therapists who want to provide culturally sensitive, really effective counseling and therapy for people mm -hmm essentially non-monogamous relationships. What would you say to them? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist, but I do uh, help train psychologists and counselors and so on. So I have some experience in that area. Yes. And in, in my experience, um, there are a lot of uh, preconceptions about non-monogamies, but there are even more preconceptions about monogamy. And I would start there. I would start by asking therapists, counselors, etc., to try and deconstruct their own beliefs about monogamy, mm. to try and deconstruct their own uh, ideas, their preconceived notions, their uh, speech patterns, and so on about monogamy. And I would ask therapists to think about something so simple as this. How many times have you heard the expression, the phrase, couples therapy? Now think of how exclusionary that is. Because I'm pretty sure that most of the people who do couples therapy, they don't intend to actively exclude anyone who is not a couple but the couple gets assumed as the normal, as the normal relationship configuration. Just that simple, simple thing can be so, so meaningful, you know, can be so metaphorically meaningful in terms of exclusion and lack of access and lack of awareness. Um, and so I would, I, I would say that is the sort of the ground zero is try to 
deconstruct what you think you know about monogamy first and then uh, go beyond that. I, I'm, uh, when I love I, when that I, idea. Do you have any ideas about practical? Like, how do you deconstruct? It's a, I mean, it's a, it's a lovely academic idea, but it's <laughs> an action. Um, well, there's there's one exercise when I'm talking to to therapists and and the public in general. There's one exercise that I usually do is that I ask people who here is or has ever been in a monogamous relationship. A lot of people raise their hands. And then I ask, of those who raise their hands, who has explicitly negotiated that relationship as being monogamous? And 90% of the people just very slowly lower their hands. And so that's a practical exercise is, uh, okay, let's say I'm in a monogamous relationship. How did I get there? Let's say I'm a monogamous person. Why am I a monogamous person? You know, ask yourself why. Why are you monogamous? What do you think you know about monogamy? And then you make a list and then you go and read up on it and see if it's actually, you know, evidence-based beliefs or not. Hmm. And um, as you know, unfortunately, most of the times it isn't. Um, right. right. And, and try and, and see, for instance, something as simple as what, what word associations do you do when you're speaking? Like, for instance, the, the very, for me, annoying association between fidelity and exclusivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something as simple as that, you know, the implications of that. So work on your vocabulary, work on your assumptions, read up on these things and do introspective exercises and ask, how and why uh, yourself or your uh, clients are monogamous. Don't just assume that you have to have an explanation for people who are different. You, you need to have an explanation for everyone. Everyone needs to have their own internal narratives. And that's what therapists work with, you know, it's internal narratives. Don't just ask for a, an explanation or an internal narrative for the people who are polyamorous and so on and so forth, because I, I see that happening a lot. You know, if you have a choice or if you have an identity that is assumed to be normal, then you don't need to explain yourself. But if you're different, then you do. So all of these things, you know, I could go on, but all of these things, I think that are, was are very beautiful. practical exercises. Yes. I think that was a fantastic description of how to actually do deconstruction in the real world and not just as yeah. a so much if, for your time no and just if you if you'll allow me just a small small Please. uh rejoinder um sometimes people i think outside of academia they 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 hear deconstruct and they think that we're just using a fancy word for destruct or destroy, yes. which is totally not the case. Right. Deconstruction means taking apart the pieces to see how it works. That's the baseline meaning of deconstruction is that you take apart, you see how it works, and then you see how those pieces could work put together in a different way. That's the basis of deconstruction. So deconstruction is, deconstruction is this, is asking yourself how, why, in what context, under what circumstances, and so on and so forth. Gorgeous. I love that example. explanation is just so elegant. And thank, <laughs> thank you for your time and your, your discussion of your interesting work. And I hope to meet you in person someday. Me too. And uh, for everyone who's watching this, feel free to reach out and contact me. I'm, I think I'm a very available person, so just keep in touch. <laughs> and would they, Dr. Daniel Cardoso in England, how yeah. else will you if they were going to look for you? Well, I have, I have my own website. Um, so it's danielscardoso.net. Um, I can, you know, send you more information afterwards if you'd like, but if you Google right. Danielle Cardoso polyamory on Google, you're probably going to run into me. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you and all of your hard work and loved that explanation of deconstruction. That was beautiful. <laughs> thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.